What's your date of birth? Oh boy, 6 24 22. 22. 1922. Oh. Coming up a uh, month after next, I'll be 93. 93. You're yep. looking good. Well, so far. So far. Okay. Uh, the uh, We're going to be inter interviewing you as a veteran. And what <laughs> branch of service were you in? I was in the Army. Uh, you want me to go ahead with telling you about what I did? And well, what? Yeah, you were, were you drafted or anything? Yes, like I that? was. I wouldn't have went if I hadn't been drafted, believe me. Yeah. After, Especially after knowing what I went through in the meantime. So. Okay. It was in February of 1943. Uh, my, myself, along with a good friend of mine, and neither one of us had been away from home a night in our life. And we had to be in Westminster on the 23rd of February, 1943 at okay. 6 a.m. to catch a, a bus to go to Fort Meade. And that, that's, that's where we went. And we, we stayed there, I think it was two days, two nights, and they said that our name would be on the list that they posted every morning if we were going to be leaving Fort Meade. So one morning we were both anxious to see if we were going to leave together, but we were on two different lists. Uh -huh. But that didn't mean too much because about a day out of Fort Meade on the train, we didn't know where we were going, he came up beside of me and we uh, we sat together all the way. Four days and three nights we ended up in Fort Lewis, Washington to take basic training. Clear across the country. Fort, Fort Lewis. We looked later on the map and we'd have been 90 miles closer to home if we'd been in the northwestern tip of Ireland. So that's how far <laughs> away we were. But anyway, we went, and when we got to Fort Lewis, it was raining, and it was after dark, and the band was there playing Hail, Hail, the Gang's All Here. I'll never forget that. That was something that you would remember by being a little old country boy and never been away from home too much before. Absolutely. So they, so they, had, they had you induction. all pumped up, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. That was my induction into the armed forces. And did you feel good about that? Well, I felt as good as you could because uh, it was everything is so strange. You think back when you were 19 years old right. and you went across the country on a train and a band playing and it raining. Now, you know, this is unusual, really, and we had no idea what to expect. But you weren't, uh, you weren't alone because you had other people feel the same oh, way. Oh, the whole train was full of new, new GIs. We right. had our uniforms and all, of course, they gave us that in Fort Meade. Uh -huh. But uh, the training, we didn't know where we were going to go for that. And this, incidentally, turned out to be the 44th Infantry Division. And they were supplying personnel for that to command that division to get that started. It had been disbanded after World War One, and uh, it was getting back in the shape then. Oh, so the division was going up to speed after yeah. it had oh, been yeah. disbanded. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's what it was all about. So, uh, so I was at Fort Lewis uh, from February until uh, June. And I thought I was going to get to come home, and I didn't. I didn't get to leave. But we were on bivouac, and uh, they came out and got me to go back to the main area. And I didn't know what for. And come to find out, I'd been selected to go to Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP, they called it, during World War II. You what never was your heard specialty? Huh? What was your specialty? Well, it wasn't a specialty. It was two things. You either were going to be trained to speak Russian, or you were going to be a, an engineer. So they put me in the engineer battalion, and uh, we went to to University of Idaho at Moscow, Idaho, the, where the capital of, the, um, um, of Idaho was, and that was for screening, and we took some more tests, and then they ended up sending me back to Eugene, Oregon, to the University of Oregon. And I was there for nine months, classrooms only, <coughs> and going to learn how to be an engineer. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> then because of uh, the advent of uh, invasion of Europe, they decided to disband that to man up all the divisions. And uh, so they disbanded the, the STP and the University of Oregon, sent me down to Camp Cook, California, to the 11th Armored Division. Hmm. So I separated from a buddy who was, still was in the was in uh, Fort Lewis, and he, he got he was always lucky. He got set up as a driver for the company commander, and we'd be out on bivouac walking the distance back to the camp every evening, 
and he'd ride by in his jeep and toot the horn and says, "Hi, Bake." You know, he had a he had a wonderful job. But I'll tell you a little bit more about him at the <clears> end because we, we I followed him all over the world and ended up back at the hospital where he was the same day he, I got there. He was leaving. Hmm. So he. And I told him he'd be dumb enough to go back to Fort Meade to re-enlist. He said, no, he wouldn't. But he stayed 22 years and ended up as a recruitment sergeant. Oh, good. Yeah. So how many years did you spend in the Army? Well, I was in a 30 months, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah, I went in in February of 43 and got out in August of 45. Okay. Now, if, if you had not been drafted, you would probably not enter the military. I probably would not have been involved. Uh -huh. I don't know. Well, I guess I would have had to enlist, wouldn't I? Right. I mean, when you're that age and you're right. able, right. you either go or they drag you along to go. So and they almost had to drag me, but I went anyhow. And went anyway. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you uh, you spent your time and got out and then came back to Carroll County? Oh, yeah. Well, there's a whole lot happened. Over, you want to hear about the experiences overseas? Well, I, I was going to oh, get to it. Go you, right okay. ahead. Yeah, go right ahead. Well, well jump into that. the thing was, uh, I, when I went to Camp Cook, California, mm -hmm. that, that was in the, in, the, in the summer of 43, and uh, I'm 44, uh, no, 43. And then uh, I went overseas in September of 44, after the invasion. Okay. Our division did. In fact, our division was completely on one ship. It was an Italian luxury liner, and uh, it was all eleven thousand men were on that one ship. And we we had two meals a day, and I was on the third bunk on the on the deck, third bunk from the bottom. I had four bunk high out on the, out on the deck, and. You got in line to eat your meal, and you got two meals a day, and but and when you got through your first meal, you got back in line for your second meal, which took you about four hours to get to that next meal. It was that many people in a very small kitchen area, huh. and then when you went down in the hole to get your meal, you brought it back up and sat on your bunk and ate it. Huh. And the thing I remember very vividly was at nighttime. This convoy, it was pitch dark. Right. And here some pitch. of us would stand along the on on the deck and look out over the ocean and wonder if how many of us would be coming back. That's always in your mind. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we got over to uh, England and we in September and we were in England until about the last part of October before they sent us back and then when the the Battle of Bulge was they surmised this was going to start, so they shoved us real quick over to the mainland of of France, mm -hmm. and then right away we had to hightail it up to Belgium area, because it was getting to be the first part of December then, and the Battle of Bulls started on the 16th of December, and we were stationed through the Hurtigon Forest, and that's where we met our first uh, contact with the enemy, because they they had this artillery come into the Hurtigon Forest, and I don't know if you ever heard of this or not, but I had never heard of it, but the, these shells would go off up in the trees, and a lot of our boys got killed because of the trees, would, the, the splinter of the wood would come down and go through their bodies. Mm -hmm. and that's how they kept, killed them, a lot of the GIs right. that way. That but anyway, and then, uh, then when the Battle of Bulls really started, they sent us up to protect the uh, News River, and we were the last uh, thing that we were to hold out to the last man to keep them from getting to the Mews River, because if they got across the Mews River, they would go to Rotterdam and cut off our, our outfit from the British, and it might be hurting on, a, on our part. So we didn't know that at the time, but we found out that later. and. Uh, and that must have been Bastogne, you know, was surrounded and all that stuff, and we weren't far from that. Were you pretty well equipped for the winter? No. I was no, wondering When we about first that. started, we had just ordinary combat boots on, you know. Right. And, uh, and we moved from one place to the other in half tracks. Right. And on the second day of January, we were moving, and we weren't supposed to be any Germans close by, but there were. 
because it started zeroing in on our group of, of uh, half tracks and, uh, and finally when they found the right range they really hammered us and that's where I got messed up because one hit under the front end and flipped this half track over and the guy and I sitting in the back end across from each other, we were the only two that survived that mess and we stayed in the, out in the snow all night then because I had both legs broken, strapped on the legs and I still don't have no feeling in my left leg. And, I see. It messed up pretty good, so I stayed in the hospital from that time on until I got discharged on the 31st of August. And uh, one memorable wow. thing that, that I always tell my friends that I think about more than anything else was when they sent us back to Paris in the hospital, there was a, we were up on several floors above the grounds, and they pushed my bed over to look out the window to see the Eiffel Tower, and the lights just went back on, had just been turned back on. Is that right? That was a beautiful sight. Uh huh. And the next day they sent me to Scotland. And I had several more operations before May the 8th. And as I showed you this paper, Stars right. and Stripes, May the 8th, the war was over. And that was the same day they were carrying me up the gangplank to get on the hospital ship to come home. And that's how I got that Stars and Stripes. They handed it to me and I kept it ever since. Could we take a look at that now? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a word. It, it, it's, uh, it's the original. And that's, that's what it said. Germany quit. Yep. It was May the 8th, 1945. Yep. And? Yeah, I, I, I hold that in high esteem because uh, that meant a lot. Apparently. And then three day, two days out of Southampton, England, a German sub surfaced right in front of us because we were out on the deck mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted to know where they could surrender. But we thought they was maliciously going to maybe upset the, the hospital ship. So they were wanting to surrender to you. Yeah, they wanted to surrender to somebody. They didn't know <coughs> who. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. So then I had, I'll tell you about the rest of it later on. Is there something else you want to ask me? Well, I, I'm just going to ask you, uh, were you married at the time? You were no, not? no, 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 no. That's, okay. that's a whole new story. Okay. And uh, your family background? Uh, well, my, fa my family was always farmers. All farmers? Yeah, my father was a farmer all his life, and my brother was. I uh -huh. had a brother and a sister. And my brother was 17 and a half years older than me, and my sister was 16 years older than me. Oh, really? And uh, <clears throat> I was a baby of the family, and they claimed that they babied me and spoiled me, you know. Did they that. see service of any kind? No, no, no. Okay. I was the only one in the family. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, the uh, next question would be, did any of your high school friends go in about the same time? You yeah, did? quite a few of them did. <clears throat> quite a few of them did, and uh, I only remember one or two. One went in the Navy, and he was messed up over in the Iwo Jima area off the coast of Iwo Jima, and they buried him at sea. Uh -huh. And uh, But other than that, the, the other guys came home. But there was three real good friends of mine and they all three were heavy smokers. Oh. And they all three died in their early 50s. I see. And I, I often wondered about that, whether the smoking was what it was. But it seemed very strange to me that three of them were, were real close together, and all, of them, all three of them died about the same ages. I see. In, in uh, World War II, we had what we call combat rations, or sea rations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what we lived on for quite a while in the field. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I guess those got a little bit old, but... Oh, yeah. And we usually ate the chocolate, kept the chocolate bars, and uh, that, that's what kept us going, I think, with our needed nourishment. Because right. Because that was about all we had towards the end over there. Because Now, we were, we did have a nice hot meal on Christmas Day. I remember that. I don't know how it was done, but it, uh, it was done anyhow. Hmm. There was a lot of little things that you think about as time goes on little stories that were interesting and stories that might be of interest to some people, not interest to another. And uh, some of that was the, the food business, how we got our strength and all. Right. Yeah. I know uh, in that sea rations, I've, I've had a few in my in my experience, but they had a, what they called a P-38. Yeah, that's can opener. That's called a P-38? Yeah, it's can opener. That's a real right. sharp little job. You and stuck it down in there and wiggled it around and opened up the can. 
yeah. as best you could. And then you got it on here with the dog tags, right? Right, because I always had my dog tags. I was always could open a can. Yeah, there you go. Uh -huh. That little thing there, you wouldn't think it would be that powerful, but it did a good job. It, it opened any and can And everybody you want. had one of them. But they used to put it on their ring with the dog tag, too, so they right. always would have it. Right. So yeah. that's kind of kind of a keepsake. Do you? That's do you have right. One, that's do you right. have one of those? Yeah, I've got my dog. I, I don't have a P38. No, oh, okay. I did have, but when I went in the hospital, I think they, I don't know, it disappeared. I don't know. If I have a spare, I will get you right. the P38. Right. Yeah, because I use it quite often. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. Because you, you couldn't open a can every day. It. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. the only way. And yeah. here I brought in a World you War II a mess, mess kit. kit too, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, isn't that something? This yeah. this was the top part, and this went over and held it together. You want to show us how that worked? Oh, well, I don't know if I remember this <coughs> long ago. I don't know if I remember or not. Uh, uh, mess kit. Is that is that the way? How did it go? Yeah, it, it, you show me. Yeah, you'd open it up, it and uh, you would put this over here like this. Upside down. There you go, yeah. like that, and that would be your dinner. Right. And this, that's your knife, fork, and spoon. That's right. And normally they just put everything in here a mess. That's right. And then maybe dessert or something over here. That's the reason they call it a mess kit. A mess kit, because it, <laughs> it... It was a mess. Right. But, you know, very seldom did we ever use this out in the field. No, you uh, didn't? You, you, yeah, no, because we ended up just keeping one part of it. And you never got a hot meal very often out in the field. So you... You didn't uh, use this a whole lot? No, no. Okay. No. In fact, <clears throat> everything you could get rid of that had any weight or unusual shape to it, you got rid of as soon as you could. Or got rid of it. Yeah. Keep it, keep everything quiet. All, <clears throat> quiet and, and, and also lightweight. Mm -hmm. You want, didn't want to carry it around any more than you had to. Right. But you talked about the, your shoes and all. But we didn't get, uh, we got later on heavier boots, but nothing like protection from the cold. You know, they claim over there that winter was the coldest winter they'd had in years. Uh-huh. Because it got down way below zero. And and the, the roads froze, and it was hard to move equipment that didn't have a track on it. Sure. If it just it depended on the four wheels, it was a little hard for trucks to move. I can remember Germany having a real damp cold. Yeah. Well, this was cold, but it wasn't very damp, but it was cold. And snow. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and it was, you know how we kept warm a lot of times? Now, this is a terrible thing to say, but a lot of farmers over there, they, they cleaned out their barns and piled what they call a manure pile. Now, it was dry manure. It wasn't fresh manure or anything like that. Right. And they, they buried their potatoes and turnips in these mounds to keep them from freezing. Okay. And we found that out, and we started digging into these mounds and getting warm because steam would come out of there. And it, that's a good way to keep warm out it, in the field. Is that right? And we did that quite often, yeah. Huh. Yep. So it's the old uh, Yankee ingenuity. That's right. Take advantage of anything you can to keep yourself going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, another question I have here for you, if, if you uh, have a moment, is uh, what did you do when you came home from the war? What, what about your well, let me first, tell you first about day how... on, on U.S. soil? Okay. When I, I told you about coming, getting on the ship, the hospital ship, right. we came back to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, okay. which is the same place we left from. And, uh, and when we got there, they said anybody that lives within a, two hours of this place can go home, except if you have a cast on. Well, I had a walking cast on one foot yet. Okay. So the nurse said to me, put a black sock over that, stand behind somebody, and put your name in for a pass, and when they come out, your name's Baker, they'll call it early on. Mm -hmm. So reach over somebody's shoulder and get your pass and go out in the bus and wait. And that way they won't know that you got a cast on your foot and you can go home. Have it camouflaged. Yeah, <clears throat> so I did. So when I got back to Baltimore, uh, well, well, first off, when I got on this train, you go clonking up the steps to get on the train over you know, this thing on your feet. Right. And a lot of people, the train was loaded, and they thought I had an artificial leg, I guess. So they, everybody jumped up and wanted me to sit down in their seat. So I got a good seat that way on the way back to Baltimore. Oh, good. When I got to Baltimore, I, I got a cab over to my uncle's house, and he was surprised to see me because I hadn't told my mother. My father wasn't living then. But okay. I hadn't told my mother I was back in the country. So he, I asked him to take me up to, to my house, which was about 20 miles out of Baltimore. 
And he said, sure. So we got up there and, at my house, and it was just almost getting dark. Uh -huh. And now this was, uh, this was, let me see now, this was in, in, uh, in uh, August. August, okay. Because uh, uh, I, I got discharged the 31st of August, so I did this on several times coming back from the hospital. But anyway, I was assigned to, to uh, the hospital in North Carolina, Duke University. Oh, good. And uh, so when, he, when I got home, my mother was in the house, and my brother was there visiting, but it was on a Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I said, I told him to keep quiet, don't say anything loud. Then my mother came out of the house, and she saw me, and she went berserk. And, and when she saw me hopping on this foot, she thought I'd lost that leg. Oh. She said, I knew it. Uh, he had lost his leg, but I hadn't. But anyway, I stayed home for 24 hours and went back. And then, uh, then, I, then there was a minister in Mount Airy that lived in North Carolina, and he would go home every once in a while. And the rest of the month of August, I'd go back with him on Monday morning to, uh, to the hospital, and then he'd let me come home. So I was theoretically in the hospital from the second day of January of 45 okay. till the 31st of August. When I got discharged, I got a what they call a CDD, Certificate of Disability Discharge. So that's how I got out. So you uh, you went back home, and then you stayed around the house, and then you, did you go back to work anywhere? Well, yes. Uh, <clears throat> after a while, I went to work uh, as a clerk in the clothing store in Mount Airy, men's clothing. Okay. And I was there about two months. And Raymond Moles was a good friend of mine. And he was a fire department captain in the government fire department at the uh, Naval Ordnance Lab down on New Hampshire Avenue. And he, he asked me if I'd want a job at the government because they had an opening. And I said, sure, I'd love to. So that's how I got started. And I stayed in the fire service in the government for 35 years. And uh, I ended up, I retired as fire chief at the National Bureau of Standards in Gaithersburg. Oh, really? And, uh, that's that was, and I've had seventy five years in the Mount Airy Volunteer Fire Department. Seventy five years. Yeah, seventy four of those were active, where I made my points for what they call a length of service award program, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's been going on ever since. Let's go back a little bit. When you came home, you were single. Yeah. Did you get married soon after you came home? Well, I had a good friend at home. I, this is funny. This man's wife is now living at where I am at Lorian Assisted Living in Mount Airy. Okay. And his, her husband was a very close friend of mine. We used to double date and go around together. So he got married. I accused her of taking him away from me because I was by myself after he got married with her. Okay. And I used to call her and ask her what she was having for dinner. And she'd tell me if something good, well, I'd, I'd say put it on another plate. So I'd go over and eat with them because he was a farmer, uh -huh. and uh, so she said, it's good that you're coming tonight because I got my cousin going to be here, and she's looking for a man. I said, well, I'm looking for a woman. Let's see what happens. <laughs> so when I got there, we both liked each other, and then we ended up getting married a year after that. Oh, good. So that, we, that was in August, and, and we got married the year from that, 46 in September. So it all started right there. Okay, and... Uh you were married for several years, had some children? Oh, yeah. We had three boys. Okay. We got two grandsons and two great-grandsons, no girls. In no the family, girls. All boys. And, uh, yeah, I had three boys, and we lived first in Mount Airy. We had a house in Mount Airy, and then we built one right outside of Mount Airy. Okay. And then we went back to the, uh, to the town where they had senior housing. And we bought the first house there that they had offered, so we moved into that. And we were married, uh, I think, some 67 years before 60. she passed away. She had Parkinson's disease oh my. for 27 years. And I kept huh. her at home the whole time, and uh, she died at the hospital. She couldn't breathe anymore, <clears> so <throat> she passed away. Uh, yeah, that's Man, you got it all out of me, everything. I you? know. <laughs> uh, what military awards did you earn during your wartime service? Well, let me see. <clears throat> Let me let me get this uh, get this discharge off of here. Okay. <clears throat> and that'll tell you. Uh, let's see. It says uh, 
Decorous European African Middle Eastern Theater, ribbon with two bronze battle stars, and the two battle stars were Rhineland and Ardennes. Okay. From over there. And then I got the, uh, the uh, what is it, was that? Purple Heart and uh, the uh, bronze, bronze, bronze medal, star? Bronze medal with two bronze battle star. stars. Okay. Yeah. And the one I prize mostly is the combat infantry badge, because that gave me ten dollars more a month. Oh ho! Yeah. Plus combat your combat pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. What? what this is a, this is my discharge from okay. uh, the hospital. Uh -huh. So the combat infantry badge. How long of a course was that? And no course. If oh, you, you had combat, and you were in the infantry. See, I I was in the Eleventh Armored Division, and okay. I was in the Sixty <clears> Third <throat> Armored Infantry Battalion, Company B. 63rd Armored Infantry Battalion. And instead of walking, we rode on half tracks instead of con okay. regular infantry. <clears throat> so you got your combat infantry badge on the job training. That's right. That's right. It sure <laughs> did. It was pretty vicious training, too. Okay. Yeah. Is there any, what is the most memorable day? I told you, the most memorable day was that seeing that light go on that Eiffel Tower in that hospital. That was a, that was a uh, that was the highlight of my okay. overseas bit. Okay. Yeah, it really was. And then when you stepped back on U.S. soil, did you want to kiss the ground? Yes, you did. You wanted to. You were so yes joyful about being back home. Yes. That, you know, people don't. You can't imagine no. what that's like unless you lived it. Right because uh, you can tell people all you want about that experience, but it meant nothing until, unless you lived it. Exactly, yeah. right. There's a certain bond between military. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And and you know, people say, what would you tell people today that joined the military? I'd say do the best you can because you're there to serve the country and right. it's your duty, really. Right. Yeah. And uh, you don't <clears throat> agree we, you know what, we go at a day of it. That's right. No. Yeah. No, that's right. But you wouldn't want to go through it again. Exactly. But you wouldn't give up a day of it because you learned so much. Okay. Huh? Well, thank you, Oscar. Okay, buddy. <laughs>